It is a joy to be able to worship together in spirit and in truth, and we welcome you in his name. And let's stand together for our song of gathering. This is, he will hold me fast. And the psalmist says, if I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. And today we're talking about the promises of God. And as uh, we celebrate uh, the reception of new members and the sacrament of baptism, uh, we all stand on those promises as we come into God's favor and as we uh, receive his Holy Spirit, those promises are what lead us into new life in him. Uh, so let's sing out our faith, singing, he will hold me fast. When I fear my faith It is good to be together as a family of faith. And again, we welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hope that you feel his presence and power as we meet together. 
and seek to worship him and glorify him. He is the reason for our gathering and he is the center of our worship. So we hope that your heart is uh, encouraged to cling to him today as we hear his word and as we experience the power of the spirit at work in each of us. I just draw your attention to some of the announcements that are listed there in your bulletins on the back. We'll be receiving and welcoming new members and their addresses are there. Uh, so just give them a warm welcome today. Also on Wednesday, we will have our regular programs at 6.30 p.m., uh, but there will not be a dinner this Wednesday. So just uh, want to make sure everyone doesn't show up at 5.45 expecting uh, food. So, uh, but we'll resume that later. Also, keep in your prayers, uh, Barry and Lynn Robinson. Barry is scheduled to come home this Tuesday from rehab at Duke. And then we'll be home for a couple of weeks getting home health uh, rehab with OT and PT. And then he'll be going back on uh, the 12th of November for about six weeks of radiation for the um, brain uh, tumor. They remove, they think, all that they could see. But of course, there might be stray cells still there. And so uh, we'll just pray that the radiation therapy and the chemotherapy are effective and completely eliminating uh, that threat and they'll be staying at the caring house there at Duke and so just let's be lifting up Barry and Lynn in the days ahead. The session in response just to uh, all they've been going through uh, would like to invite folks if they feel uh, so moved to give to a special fund to help Barry and Lynn with travel expenses and other uh, expenses they'll be having over the next uh, several weeks especially and months to come. Uh, if you'd like to donate toward that, you can just put their uh, name on the offering envelope and their offering envelopes in all four corners of the sanctuary in the offering baskets there. Uh, just put their name there and the session uh, is going to match those gifts up to $1,000 from our special compassion fund. Um, and so your money will be doubled. And so um, we're grateful for uh, the way the Lord has worked in Barry and Lynn's life and brought healing so far. Uh, they've got a long way to go still, so we want to support them in that journey. Also be praying for Donna Vernon. Uh, Brian's mom fell this past week and had surgery, so shoulder replacement surgery on Friday, which went well, and she's back home resting. So let's lift these folks up in our prayers. We're thankful, Lord, that you call us as your unique people set apart from the world to worship you to live out a life of faith, to journey with you as Abraham did, as Moses did, as David and others, Lord, throughout the history of your people. Help us to walk with you each day. And we pray that you would walk especially with Barry and Lynn in the days ahead as they uh, go through different hurdles, Lord, that are coming up. Pray that you would continue to help Barry's therapy, get back, in, back to walking and uh, to speaking clearly and uh, just being able to reconnect those brain tissues and the different pathways that he needs in order just to resume normal life and strengthen them through this time, Lord, and help us to be generous in supporting them. Help us most of all to be faithful in prayer for them. And we pray for Brian's mom, Donna, in the days ahead, that you would knit her shoulder back together and give her health and strength, Lord. We give you all praise that you are a God of healing. We pray for all, Lord, who are suffering today in our family of faith, whether a small issue or a larger issue might loom. We just pray that your shalom, your peace, would guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, that we would know that we never walk alone in this world, Lord, that you are our constant companion and guide. And may you go before us like a good shepherd, guiding us and leading us to green pastures and walking with us even through the valley of the shadow of death, Lord. And so we have no fear as we trust in you. We're thankful, Lord, for uh, the new members that you've led into the life of our church and help us to celebrate and welcome them. And we give you all praise and thanks for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. On behalf of the session, I present the following individuals who have participated in the membership class and have been 
received and examined by the session and have sincerely confessed their saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And please come forward as your name's called. Joining by transfer of church letter and reaffirmation of faith, Jane Burkhart and Marvin Leslie. By reaffirmation of faith, Sarah Nestor. And Rebecca Collier couldn't be here today, but Rebecca is also joined. And by profession of faith and baptism, Logan Nestor. Logan and Sarah are also presenting their children, Claire Joyce, Joyce, uh, uh, Claire Joyce Nestor and Jack Robert Nestor for baptism. All right. You can stand with your parents if you want. You can stand with me. I, I would love that. So friends, as you join with us in the worship and service and mission of this congregation, it's fitting that together we reaffirm the covenant into which we are baptized, claiming again the promises of God, which are ours in the sacrament of baptism. God has chosen you, and in baptism we enter the covenant that God has established. In that covenant, God gives us new light. We are guarded from evil and nurtured by the love of God. And God's people, in embracing God's new covenant in Christ, we choose whom we believe by turning from evil and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I ask you all, therefore, to reject sin, to profess your faith in Jesus Christ, and to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. So <coughs> I'll ask you this first question all together. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin? And renounce evil and its power in the world. If so, please say, I do. Now I'll ask you all in turn, starting with Logan. Logan, who is your Lord and Savior? And Sarah, who is your Lord and Savior? Marvin, who is your Lord and Savior? And Jane, who is your Lord and Savior? And this one is all together. Will you be Christ's faithful disciples, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, please say, we will. And will you be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will. Let's have a prayer for these folks. Lord, we're so grateful that you are a God of covenants, of promises, and that when we confess you as Lord and Savior of our lives, Lord, you will save us and draw us to yourself. So draw these newest members of our church, Lord, closer and closer to you. May you enrich their walk with you. May they find avenues of service and mission here among us. And may we minister, Lord, to them as they seek to mature in Christ and grow in faith. Bless their families, bless their time, Lord, as we grow together and walk this journey that you've called us into. And may they grow richer in faith and love and joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Jane and Marvin, y'all can have a seat for just a minute. And Sarah and Logan, y'all can come up a little closer now to the baptismal font. Since the earliest days of creation, hey Jack, you can come on over here. Water has been a symbol of God's saving power in the world. Hey, where do you want to go? When we read the Genesis account, we see that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters in Genesis 1, and out of that he brought forth all life. Later, through the history of the people of God, God parted the waters in order to redeem his people Israel and to bring them out of slavery. And in the New Covenant, we see Jesus command us to baptize those who believe and to make disciples, and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And so we rejoice this day uh, that God has called us to come and baptize uh, not only us, but our children. Peter said in his sermon at Pentecost, this promise of God's goodness and the path of salvation through Christ is for you and for your children. And just as circumcision in the older covenant was a setting apart of children, is especially blessed by God. So now in the new covenant in Christ, it is baptism which marks our children as the child of the covenant. Infant and child baptism is not a guarantee of saving faith, but rather a, a, save, a sign of the incredible grace of Christ and being raised in a godly home by followers of Jesus. Baptism is not an end, but rather the beginning of an exciting journey in faith in which we pray the Holy Spirit will be at work in the lives of our children until they themselves one day will confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. The baptism of our children give witness to the truth that God initiates his relationship with us even before we are able to respond to him in faith or articulate what we believe. So first of all, Logan, having publicly expressed your personal faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, do you desire to now be baptized? And Logan and Sarah, as you bring Claire and Jack to be baptized by God's grace, do you promise to live out your Christian faith on a daily basis and to teach that faith to Claire and Jack bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If so, please say we do. Our Lord ordered us to teach those who are baptized all that he has commanded us. Do you as members of the church of Jesus Christ promise before uh, to God, Logan, as a friend, as a brother in Christ, to teach Claire and Jack the good news of the gospel? to guide and nurture them by word and deed with love and prayer and encouraging them to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of his church. If so, please respond. We do. We do. Let's pray together. We praise you, almighty God, for the newness of life symbolized in this water of baptism. We praise you as the author of all life and out of the waters of creation you drew forth that life and you have now given us life, a life that we did not earn, but which is simply a gift. And so Lord, we pray for those who now come for baptism that you might enliven their hearts, that you might fill it with your spirit, that you might guide them, Lord, in the path of your peace and of your will for their lives. May this moment, Lord, be always remembered, and may it be recalled often as they face the temptations and darkness of this broken world. We praise you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. So, Logan, if you'll come and just kneel here. Logan Mitchell, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks for Logan as a brother in Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen him, that you would give him courage and strength as he fulfills the many roles that he plays in his life, as husband as father, as son, as brother, as co-worker, as friend, as neighbor. Lord, we're so grateful that you have put a special calling on his life. Strengthen him now, Lord, that he might fulfill those callings with joy and with a great sense of your unending love. May he recall this time of baptism, Lord, as an important marker in his life to know that his life is forever changed and his heart has been transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
as he's received you by faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Stand up. Claire, if you'll come over here. Claire Joyce, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray for Claire. Lord God, we pray for Claire today that you would watch over her and give her your strength. Lord, help her to know you and to confess you as her Lord and Savior. Bless her, Lord, as she walks with you. We're thankful, Lord, that to such as these, you tell us, Claire and Jack, belong the kingdom of God. And may we learn to follow you even as they know you in their heart. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Jack. Here we go. What you got there? All right. So, Jack, look. See that? Jack Robert. All right. We're going to get through this. Jack Robert. I baptize you in the name of the Father. You want to play in the water? You want to play in the water? And the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we pray for Jack today that you would strengthen him and give him your peace, Lord. Help him to know you and to walk with you all his days. We're thankful, Lord, for this family. We pray that their home might be guided by love, guarded by prayer, infused with the power of the Spirit, Lord, that they might worship you and love you as a family of faith. And we're thankful again, Lord, for leading them into the life of this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Jane and Marvin and Logan and Sarah, we welcome all of you, thanks for joining us. We're so thrilled to have you. And I'll invite uh, those of you who can to be at the front of the, uh, of the church as we leave today. And folks can greet you and welcome you. So um, I think it's appropriate <coughs> just to welcome them with a round of applause. <laughs> so we're thrilled to have, have you all. I invite you to stand for our call to worship. Lily. Would you hand that? This is from Luke 1. Again, we are looking at the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and how they stand on the promises of God. So Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. To enable us to serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. To give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God. Amen. Let's continue our worship as we sing King of Kings.
Lord, we confess that we are broken people, that we are broken sisters that can't hold water. We pray, Lord, that you would fill us up continually through the power of your spirit, that you would mend us and remake us, Lord. We confess that we're sinners and that we've strayed from your path and we fall far short of your perfect standard. And so we give thanks, Lord, for the power of your grace that renews us and ushers us into your presence. Help us to humble ourselves today, Lord, and may we dedicate all that we are to you and may you build your kingdom through our obedience, through our generosity, through the way we love our neighbors as you have loved us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, may be seated.
morning. I'm glad to see you. It's a special day today, isn't it? A lot of nice, special things are happening. Um, I'm, do you see those pumpkins up there? Well, we're going to talk about pumpkins. I think pumpkins are a good way, especially carving a pumpkin, is a good way to talk about how good God is, about how our life and God. So I brought some pumpkins, and um, if we were to pick out a pumpkin, if you were to say which pumpkin um, you like, which one would you like best? Which one? The orange one? My gosh, the big one or the little orange one? <coughs> I like that one too. How about you, Jack? And good, Lily. I'm glad. I like the little one too. Maddie? I'm sorry. Maddie, I, ca I call Maddie two times today. She's usually in church, so I guess I'm thinking about it. We might have to pray for her before I leave this. This is Annie. So which one did you like, Annie? The big one? Well, you know, it, when God, when God, uh, he, he chooses us. This is that little note here. In, in the Bible, it tells us that God chooses us. God chooses us. And we, and we don't, we choose, we have an opportunity to choose him. So we're kind of using pumpkins about, um, who would, and when God chooses us, would he have to just pick the big one? Would he pick the pretty one? Would he pick the one without spots? Which one would God choose? Well, he might, but not really. God doesn't make any difference. It doesn't matter whether we are um, perfect. It doesn't matter if we're not perfect. It doesn't matter if, uh, in, the, in the case of uh, pumpkins, it doesn't matter whether they're dirty a little bit or whether... We have problems. God would never, uh, he would never choose anyone but us. He would choose all of us. So when he would pick, he would go, Lily, Jack, Claire, and Annie. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, and, and me, and everybody here. And when he would choose us, then um, he, he would, once God chooses us, he gives us an opportunity to be his. I'll pick up the pumpkin now. I might drop this so I I'm, the, I'm going to choose a pumpkin, but I'm just going to choose a pumpkin because I have to choose one. And I'm not going to tell you why. Okay, so if God were, if I chose this pumpkin, but if people think that God chooses you because of anything special, that wouldn't be right. Because see, I chose one with a big old ugly scar there, and I like it. I washed it. So once God has chosen us and we have decided to let him choose us, then he, he cleans us. He washes us. We might be, who knows where we might be. But God, once he says, once I say to him, God, I want to be yours. I know you've chosen me and I want to be yours. Then God cleans us up. So last night when I was doing this pumpkin, I put it in the water and I washed it all up and got it clean. But there's another thing that God does whenever he chooses us. Jack, you want to come help me a minute? Could you, could you tap hold the lid? It's kind of messy. Do it the best way you can, okay? Okay. And then turn around so they can see you holding the lid. Make yourself comfortable. You ready? Once God chooses us and we accept the fact that he's going to choose us, he gets us all washed up, maybe on the outside. I always think washing with tears. Because the first time that I realized that I wanted to give my heart to Christ, I cried. I just couldn't stop crying. And I always felt like that was washing, God washing my heart. But he also has to do something else. Because we can't come to God with sin in our life. What's that? Is saved. But when God cleans our hearts up, when he goes and cleans our hearts up, and there's some things in our heart that we have to get cleaned up. Can you think, this might be a little bit much and you don't have to answer. Can you think of something we might have to clean up in our heart? 
how about obedience? We might, let's see, let's see, this, maybe God is going through all of our sins. That's a lot of sins, isn't it? I think maybe when I got saved, I might even have more sins than that. But God goes through the sins and he says, I'm going to clean up the sin of for children to, to obey your parents. It's important to obey your parents, isn't it? Do you do that well? Yeah, you do. Your mama said you do. So he might say, we need to obey our parents. But then he might say, we need to obey God, right? If, we, if God has chosen us and we're going to be his, we need to be, obey God. But he might even have something for the parents where the, he might say, you may need to obey the speed limit. Don't go too fast in the car, right? So there's a lot of things that once once God, or once we give our hearts to God, little by little, or maybe all at once, He cleans up all the sin that's in our that's in our hearts, and we and we become Him. And He He did that. It's called He did that in a way of redeeming. He redeemed us. Jack, will you hold that? Give me it back. Okay. You want to sit down? You got a whole lot of sin there. Be careful. Anyway, so once he, once he, you can just set it on the bench there. See, it's all nice and tight, so it won't get the bench dirty. But once he, once he comes in and he cleanses us, uh, the way he does that is it, also called called redeeming. Do you know how he redeemed us? That word redeemed. Uh, what would be a good way? I had it in my mind. The word redeemed means that we would pay for. It. You know, when we go get something at the grocery store, have you bought? Have y'all ever gone to the checkout and paid for something? But then he paid for it, and he paid for it through the blood of his son. God gave his son Jesus. He redeemed us so we could be saved. And once that happened, something really, really good happened because then we have the Father who created us, who chose us. We have the Son who gave his life. For us, and then we have the Holy Spirit once we've been redeemed that we can have light. Lily, you want to come help me? Will you get that stuff off? Go get that stuff off the back. See those two things? In the back of the pumpkin. Two. One and the other. They need help. Sometimes they need to be involved. <laughs> Red. Okay. So now, once he's redeemed us, I should have had a higher table. I'm going to take this and put it on. He redeemed us, and the Holy Spirit comes, and he puts the light in our heart. You can sit down. He puts the light in our heart. He is the light. Wait, something's wrong. What's wrong? You can't see the light. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm not a good carver. But anyway... Once he, once he redeems us, then the Holy Spirit fills us with light. And the reason the Holy Spirit fills us with light is not just about us. It's about everybody you meet. We become the light. We become the light so that everybody that we meet understands that God loves them, that he will choose them, and that he will redeem them, and that he will put a light in their heart, too. Let's see if I turn that one. Look at that. Isn't that nice? You like that body? Well, it, it, I talked about how that each of us were different. Um, so I thought just for one more minute, here, Lily, you can choose any color you want that's your favorite color. And, and no, take the button, the whole thing, and press one button, your favorite color. See, he loves Lily just like Lily is. Claire, give it to Claire now, let her choose the button. Hit a button, hit it when you want. You like her? This is very pretty. And that's Claire. You want to let Jack do it? Let Jack push a button. Yeah, because see, we're, oh, I like that one too. Jack, you want to take it down to Annie and let her push a button? You like that? 
because we're all different and we all have our certain life. You guys did a really, really good job. Okay. So when so when we so when we're when we let our light shine, we let our light shine in all sorts of ways. How you speak to people, how you treat people, uh, just how you love God. So this is our light shining. Let me put this back. You can I don't know if the pastor will let it stay on, but I don't know how to turn it off. Oh, let me put this back. Now I can pray for you. Father, thank you for the children in our church. Thank you for Lily and Claire and Jack and Annie, Maddie that's not here today, and Jack, Claire's brother, and all the other children that come into our church. Father, I pray that as they come in, that this is where they're learning the word. This is where they're learning how to love you. And I pray that we as Christians and we as adults, Father, set the example that we let our light shine in this church, in our home, everywhere we go, so that our children can follow us. And we give you the praise for everything today in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, we can go out with Mrs. Buchanan right now. Let's follow her out. Stephen's got our scripture reading for today. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wonderful thing about it asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His, va- his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and he has redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to his father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him in all our days, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet unto the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. What is the foundation of your life? On what are you standing? Is it solid ground? Or is it shifting sand? The scriptures call us again and again 
to stand on the promises of God. Are you standing on those promises today? We live in a world of constant change, constant uncertainty. And if we seek to live by the world's values, by the world's standards and expectations, then we will have no stability, no ability to stand during storms, during the trials of life. Though not perfect in their faith or in their obedience, Zachariah and Elizabeth nevertheless demonstrated a persistent, stubborn faith in God's promises at the circumcision and naming of their son, John the Baptist, as Zechariah and Elizabeth affirm God's promises through that ancient covenant of circumcision. And that faith is not lived out under ideal circumstances. To say the least, we tend to see the stories around John the Baptist's birth and later Jesus' birth through sentimental rose-colored glasses. And we sort of romanticize the circumstances. If, you know, we might think if I were in those ancient ideal conditions, I too would be full of faith, but I live in a much different world. And yet, as we talked about Wednesday night in our Bible study, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God that appeared to Zechariah and Elizabeth appeared, has appeared to us in Christ. So we've talked about over the past couple of weeks, Zechariah and Elizabeth lived in a time of tremendous political and spiritual and personal difficulty and turmoil. Politically, they were under the rule of Herod, who was a violent, even murderous, tyrannical king. We might think we're anxious about the upcoming election, as I've heard many people articulate over the past few months. But at least we have a voice and a vote in the matter. Zachariah and Elizabeth lived in a day when they had no choice who sat in authority over them. And Herod himself was subservient to the Roman Empire, who, which occupied Israel and which was highly suspicious of Judaism and which would eventually destroy, in fact, Jerusalem and the great temple in response to a Jewish rebellion. So Elizabeth and Zechariah's situation might be more akin to living in a place like China or North Korea in today's world than in a democratic society such as ours. It was a tough and anxious time for the Jewish people. And spiritually, it had been 400 years since the Lord had last raised up a prophet to guide the people. And they had been led astray by false teaching that had really turned Judaism into a pride-filled, dead religion of earning God's favor rather than humbly accepting and admitting their own sin and accepting God's forgiveness and grace is a gift. So spiritually, it was a difficult time for them as well as a people. And personally, Elizabeth and Zechariah had wanted a child their whole lives, but had remained childless. And it wasn't until they were very old, well advanced in years, at least 60, probably older, that Elizabeth miraculously became pregnant. This news was powerfully announced by the angel Gabriel as Zechariah was serving in the temple, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, but unfortunately Zechariah questioned God's messenger and the veracity of the good news he bore. And so as a discipline, Gabriel declared that Zechariah would remain silent for the entire nine months of Elizabeth's pregnancy and unable to speak and had to resort to writing on a tablet in order to communicate. And in today's reading, Luke suggests that Zechariah was deaf as well and unable to hear as it says that they had to make signs in order to communicate with him. And so despite all these difficult and challenging circumstances, politically, 
spiritually, personally. Zechariah and Elizabeth remained obedient to the Lord and to his word. It's prescribed by the law. Luke notes that on the eighth day after John was born, Zechariah and Elizabeth had John circumcised. Verse 59, on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. Circumcision played a central and a fundamental role in the Jewish faith as they lived under the older covenants of Abraham and later of Moses. Circumcision is a sign of God's covenant love. And covenant is a word that simply means a sacred promise. It goes all the way back to Abraham himself when God began to set apart first a family and then later a whole nation of people to follow him. It was first instituted by the Lord in Genesis 17 after giving Abraham these wonderful promises of making him a father, not only of Isaac, but of many nations. And just like the case with Zechariah and Elizabeth, the promise of a child for Abraham and Sarah was also a miracle. As Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90 when Isaac, the child of God's promise, was born to them. Here in Luke 1, Luke notes the detail that it was carried out on the eighth day of the child's new life as prescribed again in Genesis 17 and Leviticus 12. Why on the eighth day? Why is that detail important for Luke to note? Well, in the weekly seven-day Jewish calendar, the first day was symbolically the day of creation. It goes all the way back to the creation account of Genesis 1. And so the eighth day would, in a sense, be the same as going back to the first day. But the eighth day represented not the original creation, but the new creation of God. That God was beginning a new work. And it pointed those under the older covenant to the coming of the Messiah. Which means the anointed one. And the Greek version of that title, Messiah, is the word Christ. Which basically means and refers to Jesus as the king. Not just any king, but the forever eternal king. The divine only son of God who would reign over the people of God forever. So as Zechariah and Elizabeth have John circumcised, they are affirming their trust in God's promises. Just as Logan and Sarah have affirmed their trust in God's promises this morning for Claire and Jack as children of God's new covenant in Christ through the sacrament of baptism. And Paul makes a strong connection in Colossians 2 between circumcision and baptism. He says, in Christ, you were also circumcised. In the putting off of the sinful nature. Not with a circumcision done by the hands of men. But with the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism. And raised with him. Through your faith in the power of God. Who raised him from the dead. So both circumcision and baptism. Point believers to the fact that. Christ was cut off for us. And that we are brought into his covenant through his blood. So that his death is counted by God as our own death. So that both circumcision and baptism symbolize the reality that Christ suffered for our sins. He paid the penalty. Suffering is our substitute dying in our place. And so Logan and Sarah are in a sense walking in the footsteps of Zechariah and Elizabeth. As they stand on the promises of God's new covenant and new creation. For themselves and for their children. They are declaring their personal confidence in God's goodness and his love. And that he will forever save his people. So again, Luke says on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they, we're not sure exactly who they were. Maybe the neighbors and relatives. We're going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, 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 no. He's to be called John. Because that was the name that the angel Gabriel had ordered that he be named. And so the new creation is also symbolized by the unexpected name of John, which Elizabeth gives to this miraculous child. It's a hint that John and the one he is preparing the way for 
are going to bring about a new order of things that is completely surprising and unexpected. The name John means Yahweh is gracious. And John will speak of God's gracious provision of a Savior through Christ. And so in bringing their son for circumcision and obediently following God's directive to name him John, they are declaring their trust in God's grace. And they are declaring their trust in the eternal promises of God. Well, the neighbors and the relatives are all kind of shocked and astonished at this. And that that they would wait for so many years for this child. And they would have uh, assumed that they would name him after his father. I heard one preacher recently was saying, you know, think about Zachariah. probably wanted a little Zach Jr. out in the backyard to toss a ball around with. And they just assumed that was the case. But then some busybodies in the group who really had no business commenting on the matters say to Elizabeth, you can imagine sort of a snooty, know-it-all kind of way. Well, dear, no one else in your family has the name John. I don't think that could be right. Surely it's not John. Isn't it funny how people feel free to give their opinion about something that they really have no business with? I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but as I said a couple of weeks ago, it was kind of intimidating to name our children. We have three of them. And whenever you get any pushback on the names that you were considering uh, to name your child from maybe relatives or friends, questioning looks, it can be a little discouraging. When Kelly and I were expecting kids, we were uh, it was an exciting time, and we were pouring through, uh, I don't know if they still have these baby book names, uh, or baby name books, and we had at least one or two of those things. Sarah, did y'all use baby names? Oh, internet, okay, so sorry, old school. Time has moved on, I'm really old. But there, were, there would be pages and pages of names. Hundreds of baby names. And over time, we would sort of develop a short list of names for each of our kids. And when people began to hear some of the names we were considering, like Aiden Rupert or Colin Washam or Lily Caroline, there would sometimes be a funny little commentary uh, that was just on this side of, you know, being a little critical Oh, that's an interesting name. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, Won't be anybody else named that, I'm sure. He'll definitely be the only one with that name. If you want him to be weird. I mean, if you want him to stand out a little bit. But really, I think uh, these busybodies were pretty lucky that Elizabeth was a godly woman and didn't just sort of tell him off right then or slap him by the head. And when they don't get the answer they want from Elizabeth, they go over to Zechariah to see if they can talk some sense into him. And Luke says, when they made signs to his father to find out what he would name the child, he asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote what? His name is John. So way to go, Zechariah. In one fell swoop, he backs up his wife, Elizabeth, and obediently carries out the Lord's command. And Luke says, immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue was set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. It became the talk of the town. They've been dealing with silent Zachariah for nine months, and now suddenly they saw him just bursting out in praise and thanksgiving to God. So let's pause here for a moment to put ourselves in Zachariah's shoes and imagine what it would have been like not to speak for nine months. As I said said before, that'd be harder for some of us than others. I won't name names. But if it were me, I might, might be tempted to be much less godly with the first words out of my mouth after nine months. You know, something like, oh, oh, oh my gosh, finally. It's been torture. Can you imagine what I've been going through for these last nine months? Can you believe what the Lord let Gabriel do to me? I mean, after all, I just ask a simple question. I think God's punishment was a little over the top, don't you? I've been obedient all my life as a, as a priest. 
I've served in the Holy Temple and this is the thanks I get? Silence, muted for nine months? It was so humiliating. But fortunately, that was not Zachariah's response. Instead, he was obedient to the Lord's decree through Gabriel. And he agreed with Elizabeth that their son's name is John. And as a result of that obedience, Zachariah's tongue was loosed. And instead of being full of protests and self-centered complaints about his nine months of suffering, he was full of praise. The Lord's nine months long discipline of silence had a powerful and transforming effect on Zechariah. It's a good reminder to us that the self-discipline of being silent, being quiet before the Lord, can be a very good thing for all of us. A powerful tool God can use in our lives to help us become more rooted, more firmly established on the promises of his word. We see godly examples of the value of silence before the Lord illustrated in other parts of scripture. Job, in the midst of his terrible trials, cried out to God and said, teach me and I will be silent. Make me understand how I've gone astray. In the prophet, the same namesake as our character today, Zechariah, says in Zechariah 2.13, be silent, all flesh, before the Lord. For he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. And the psalmist famously says in Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. In order to grow and mature spiritually, in order to embody God's peace, to find his joy, to embrace his love in our modern broken world, jam-packed with noise and clutter and a constant stream of news and social media, many, many of us would do well to engage in a self-discipline of silence and quiet times of muting the world's bombardment of bad news. Instead, take time to quietly meditate on the good news of the gospel, to meditate on the good news of God's promises and the wholesomeness of his truth and I'm preaching to myself here. But let's together turn down the radio. Turn off the television. Turn off the constant news stream that just gets our blood boiling and our blood pressure raised. Take out the earbuds. Put away the phones for at least an hour a day. And be silent and quiet before the Lord. To many of us, that might sound impossible. We've grown so used to the voices of the world drowning out our own self, negative self-talk. And we've habitualized ourselves to just drowning ourselves in noise and negative input. So how did Zachariah do it? What gave him the strength to stand on God's promises? Well, Luke gives us another important detail in verse 67. It says, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied. And he said, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. So Zechariah did not accomplish this on his own. He didn't do it through reading a bunch of self-help books. He didn't do it by willpower. He didn't praise God because he was more religious than his friends or more moral than his extended family. Zechariah was able to respond to God's discipline with praise because he humbled himself and he emptied himself. He denied himself and let go of his rights and he opened his heart to the spirit of God. And the Spirit filled him up. Zechariah continues his prayer in verse 69. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, which was prophetic language, really kind of a secret code, which pointed to Jesus as the eternal king who would come and save his people. And Zechariah is so confident of this that he speaks of it in the past tense. He has raised up a horn of salvation. 
says it's already a done deal, even though Jesus has yet to be born. But Zechariah knows from Elizabeth's visit with young Mary that Jesus is on the way. Aslan is on the move. Zechariah prophesies about the future ministry of his son. He says, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins because of the tender mercy of God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. The promises on which Zachariah and Elizabeth stood were built on God's promise of Jesus as the Messiah. What is the foundation of your life? Are you standing on the promises of God? About 30 years later, after the events Luke describes here, the one to whom John's life pointed, Jesus, in his most famous sermon on a hill, what we call Sermon on the Mount, said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The wind blew, the storms came, but the house stood firm because it was built on the rock. So Jesus calls us to trust in him, to stand in him, the rock, and the rock of his word, and to build our lives on the strong foundation of his promises. Friends, let's together stand on the promises of God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can stand on these sacred promises, these covenants of grace that your people experienced time and time again through Abraham, through Moses, through David. And now as we experience as a new covenant community in Christ, may we stand on the promise of your love, of your favor, a grace that abounds more than our sin. Help us to humble ourselves as the Elizabeth and Zechariah as we seek to serve you, Lord, with all our hearts. Give us the strength, Lord, and the courage to stand on the promises that you offer through Jesus, your Son. Fill us with your Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn by that very title, Standing on the Promises. It's number 410 in your hymnal if you'd like to follow along. And we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5.
Amen.